This is the 23rd class of our Dogmatic Theology II, the second semester of this uh, series of courses. And before uh, going further, I'll just offer this prayer for the repose of the soul of John Exley Upham. Let us pray. Remember thy servant, O Lord, according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people, and grant that increasing in knowledge and love of thee, he may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service to thy heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Okay, this course, this class today, 23, is the church uh, ministry, New Testament to the post-apostolic era, and notes of the church unity, holiness, Catholic and apostolic, all good, important things to note about the church. We are in the church section, which started last time, two weeks ago, and we'll go on to number class 24. The Christian ministry in the New Testament. The classic ministry of the church has suffered in modern times, and since the Reformation, some of the strife and disunity came out of the corruption and abuses of the Roman church, leading to a revolt and the subsequent reformation. The resulting standpoint of the revolutionary church has greatly changed the expectation and definitions of church ministry. And we will not be studying all of these effects here, but acknowledge them and then go on to speak entirely of Catholic ministry. That's what we are. The Catholic ministry is one of the divine ordering of a covenant. The Christian covenant is a sequel to that of the Old Testament covenant in unbroken inheritance for us. Christ built his new covenant church upon Peter and the apostles to be a church equipped to proclaim the gospel, to order good lives, to dispense the sanctifying graces of the Holy Spirit, and to extend the church to all lands and peoples, the body of Christ, heaven on earth. Christ's actions and teachings with respect to ministers was to choose the 12 upon which he built his church. And he gave them specialized training and unique experiences and an example for them. He commissioned them as we will repeatedly see in this class. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's the end of Matthew's Gospel. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so, send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. John 20, 19 through 23. Jesus also commissioned 70 or 72 others to preach and prepare for visitation. These were in similar but not equal ministry with the apostles, therefore, and akin to what later became deacons and presbyters. In the end, the apostles were established as a permanent ecclesiastical order and office until he returns again. Apostolic Developments. The apostles operated the ministry pretty much by themselves for a while, but soon saw the wisdom of diversifying and appointing help from others, 
The first decision was led by the Holy Spirit and with the mind of Christ, as the apostles declared the opening of a new position for the seat of the fallen Judas, bound and chose Matthias, the saint of the apostolic succession. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, a caldama, that is to say, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, under that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Acts chapter 1. After that, and similarly led by the Holy Spirit, they chose seven deacons and ordered them as holy servants. Outside the scriptural record, the apostles also determined to elevate an order of presbyters, elders, who were in time to be named priests. Under the apostles, but above the deacons, the church, with little exception, accepted the rule of the apostles and their chosen ministries. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord, on whom they believed, Acts 14. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee, Titus 1. And Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Philippians 1.1 1, 1. In 1 Timothy 3, St. Paul delineates the character required of bishops and deacons. The New Testament era had little controversy in establishing these ministries. The conflicts with Simon of Samaria and with the Judaizers, more related to use and application of ministry, or of doctrine, rather than a direct challenge to the orders themselves. The threefold ministries were for the administration and official application of doctrines and sacramental grace. The dynamics of the Holy Spirit also worked independently of that, but not in conflict. but not in conflict when gifts of special character appeared in the members and these gifts were made welcome if they were under authority. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, Diversities of tongues, 1 Corinthians 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, Ephesians chapter 4. This is about special divine service. 
and sometimes appointed appointment as well to formal ministry. But all was to work in unity and not call out one saint over the churches, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Ephesians 4 again. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Corinthians 4. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up in a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2. So as the church felt its way into its ordained ministry and permitted and honored its specially gifted members, a pattern emerged and they followed it by the guidance of the Holy Spirit and in the mind of Christ, who is our head. The method of ordinations was always, and remains, the laying on of hands with prayer by the apostle bishops. In the ordering of the first deacons it was so, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, Acts 6.6. 6. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of hands of the presbytery, 1 Timothy 4. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands, 2 Timothy 1. Presbyters here is, by the early use, only to mean leaders, not specifically the order of the priesthood. So Paul refers to himself in the latter epistle, referring to the same ordination. Post-apostolic ministry. Throughout church history, the ministry has remained as Christ instituted and commissioned it, and as the apostles perceived the extensions of it to be. It became apparent that a modeling on the Old Testament orders of high priest, priests, and Levites was now being replicated by the New Testament apostles presbyters, and deacons. The phases of change came from Christ's original deposit, then the apostles and their various arrangements, then the organizing of local churches, and a continuous practice and doctrine of ministry that was uniformly recognized throughout the Christian world, much unlike it is today. The change from apostle to bishop was an obvious step. This chief office was, at first, sent out into all the world. They were missionaries, containing all the ritual and spiritual authority to plant and fully empower a local church, ordain its ministers, and move on. But in time, men of the same category of empowerment were needed to stay in the major cities and rule the church from there, thus not sent out, but overseen. And the name overseer became uh, stuck, episcopos, or bishop. They were of the same order as the apostles, but their name followed the new function. This was happening even in the time of St. Paul. The threefold ministry has been worldwide the same, both in East and West, with minor differences. Even the papacy, rightly defined, is simply a bishop. The power to order and consecrate has always been retained by bishops who, in an unbroken line of succession, maintain the unity of the church throughout the entire world and all time. As noted above, extraordinary gifts and outworkings of the Holy Spirit are present and made space for, but not accommodated or conflicting in the threefold ministry. 
The early fathers confirmed these lines of ministry. St. Clement of Rome wrote in strong support of the apostolic orders. St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote that the three ministries were essential to the life of the church. The ministers represent Christ and the apostles as they were a century before, the church for the world of men. Christ built the church on the apostles, as we've said, his Holy Spirit to be our guide until time is no more. The function of ministry is an extension of the church and the apostles and will rise and fall together, essential to each other. <coughs> Christ, as head of the body, leads an organism and is our mediator between heaven and earth. Christian ministry as prophet, priest, and king. The prophetic office. The ministry's prophetic office is established clearly by these scriptural references. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And though I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Matthew 10. Thus, commissioning the apostles to teach, give commands, disciple, and represent Christ himself to all the people of the world at large. He named them prophets, people with God's message to the world. And the church is the message of God to the world. It's important to recognize the revolutionary manner in which the church was born. Every other religion is and has always been a cultural expression of the theology of a single people group. Judaism was clearly this. Hinduism is that, and for Hindus, Islam is Arabian. Every land and people had a religion and it remains ethnically based. Christ's very command was universal. Though his mission was first to the Jews, no Christian covenant existed after his life that resorted simply to save the people of its own race, tribe, nation, or ethnicity. It's the earmark of the one true genuine message from the Creator, not just of a small group, but of a universe. How could he be only for part of humanity, all of whom he had created? Jesus is Savior of the world, Jew and Gentile, or he is not the one we've waited for. The priestly office. God is on high, and we are his children, in such a derivative position below him to serve him above. He gives grace to us, and we are given an authorized approach to God. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. We've read this already. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. The act of remitting sin is a priestly act. The Christian priest offers up the Eucharistic sacrifice, of which we'll speak at length in a later class. This is Christ's priesthood, and we participate in him. The sacrifice is his. Our priesthood is corporate and not individual, and it is by and for the whole body of Christ. A priest has a derivative ministry which depends on Christ. It is social, and it is sacramental. Now the kingly office. The kingly office of our ministry is the earthly machinery of the kingdom of God on earth. The church is a divine jurisdiction that is voluntary, not coercive, Divinely, the church is a monarchy, 
of which Jesus Christ is king. The Anglican province of Christ the king named appropriately. Humanly, the church is the organic living and breathing body of Christ on earth. The purposes of the kingly office are spiritual and pastoral, yielding salvation and sanctification by the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. Now the notes of the church. Fully, in its original expression, the church is described by that doctrine as one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. These are the notes or earmarks or components of the real church of Jesus Christ in any age. We find it referred to in the two creeds, two major creeds. It is his universal church. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone of whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, which echoes the former prophecy of Isaiah 28. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. The church is visible, even as the mystical body of Christ, apparent here on earth in human form. Any church organization on earth without these four notes is limited in its power to transform humanity and complete the commission. The church is an organism, one only, and thus not a series of denominations or independent congregations or societies. The church is itself a relationship extending through the living and the dead with evidence of its antiquity. It is alive today, but is fully in corporate connection with the history, church, historic church, by these four notes unbroken and fully present. Any part or portion of Christianity that, sitting alone and away from others, considers itself to be the whole and entire church, the only true church, they are out of harmony with the nature of Christ's church, which is universal and worldwide. Unity. The church is one. When God looks down and sees his church, he sees one church, the body of Christ, united around him and seeking him and going with him to an eternal kingdom. It is a visible church, partly, and should live in peace and love. The church's unity is like the various unities of family, culture, nation, mankind. The unity is numerical, universal, and locally only as extensions of that oneness. The unity is organic, living, and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, Christ as its head. It is also indivisible, whereas schism sinks us from the divine ideal to a man-made ecclesia. Catholic Christianity, no matter how varied and broken up we are still, shares a generic likeness that is preserved in one faith, an apostolic mind, the sacraments, similar worship, common precepts, one spirituality, and recognizable forms. As said, schism, whether internal or external, East versus West, Roman versus Anglican, wounds the church seriously. We ought to pray for unity. And in fact, we do. In the Book of Common Prayer, page 37, there is a prayer for the unity of God's people. I'll pray it now. O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior, the Prince of Peace, give us grace seriously to lay to heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy divisions. Take away all hatred and prejudice and whatsoever else may hinder us 
from godly union and concord, that as there is but one body and one spirit and one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, so we may be all of one heart and of one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify thee through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And still there is but one church in reality. Individuals may disavow the church, may start new works, and still be empowered by some amounts of God's grace, yet be lacking the vital force of a single church on earth. For a thousand years, the church has been lacking this unity. The regaining of this unity would be a very important step, the very expressed will of Christ himself. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in us, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me, John chapter 17. And as St. Paul has put it, who faced disunity, even in his day, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, even as we are called in one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. We see here where the common prayer came up with that prayer who is above all and through all and in you all, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Ephesians 4. This unity would be so crucial if we'd see the force of it to convince the world that we are representing God himself. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. John 17. The world looks at disunified churches and concludes that our gospel is not true. This disunity reduces our external efficiency. Therefore, by such conflict, competition, isolation, and money and time lost spent in fighting, our internal efficiency withers in disharmony. So much grace lost. How can we restore the unity? This question involved and concerned much of the Christian world in the latter half of the 12th, 20th century. Vatican II raised hopes of reunification under Rome, but that was dashed by continued human weakness for dominance Protestant ministries sought the reconciliation with each other via the shedding of the denominational distinctions, but were stumped on the subject of the apostolic bishops residing within the Episcopalians. All participating churches willing to forego any cherished and unique doctrines of their own and seeking a common denominator. This instructor does not see any external solution to this disunity but finds a way to better internal unity if we will seek it and we will do it. Many church ministries are open to meetings of various clergy 
for prayer with and for each other. Seeking God's guidance, worshiping Christ in union, and not disavowing characteristics of any church's tradition, but sharing and celebrating these with respect and appreciation. <clears throat> Each part offers something that can add to others. No one church has it all. Disunity clearly is disobedience. But how to do it safely and keep our own flavor and authority? We need to love. That was Christ's command. Not dissolve traditional truth and disavow history. But to love as he loves us. <clears throat> Nothing stops us from doing that. In corporate unity, Rome would logically and numerically need to be central. What could happen to make it acceptable for all of us to enter union there? God is not in a hurry. He looks down and sees his church, the true church. And the boundaries of that are not as we define them, not anybody. The second note is holy. The church is holy. The church is holy, separated from the world to God, to bring people from the world to God to find their destinies with God. Holy means such a separation, and not and only by inference does it imply righteousness. Righteousness is moral conduct, while holiness is a relational station, a consecration, assimilating it with God. Thus, holy does not mean righteous, though they are both qualities that are needed. In real terms, Christ favored the believing sinners over the righteous Pharisees. Faith over performance. The fruits and observable qualities and signs of holiness, however, are what is good and truthful and beautiful. The church is holy. One, in vocation, as the Israel of God, in the world but not of it, called out. Two, in function, and by its means we are drawn to God. Three, in destiny, and we are the bride of Christ, who also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, Ephesians 5. <coughs> Evils in the church enter by sins and moral failures of individuals, by secular ideals, by doctrines opposed to holiness, by neglect of spiritual privileges, and ideas that only a few choice persons are to be saints. The cure for these evils is not to revolt against the church or to seek puritanism or exclusivity. Sinners in the church are not banished, usually, but may be excommunicated temporarily or otherwise spiritually disciplined, seeking personal revival and restoration. The third word is Catholic. The church is Catholic. The first to speak in that terminology was, we think, St. Ignatius of Antioch around 110 AD. The church is a whole worldwide body not the local congregation. Catholic means universal. And that body is the true church sent out by Christ as commissioned in Matthew 28. This was greatly different from the Old Testament commissioning, which allowed or appeared to allow the Hebrews to draw in and exclude the nations around them and their detestable religions. The dynamic is changed. And we are sent to the whole world. Catholic means we are adaptable. As we have been sent to all men, we need to frame the message in ways understandable to them, using their language, even adopting some symbols and usages that are native to them, while never at the same time creating syncretism that pollutes the true gospel of Christ. Care is needed here. Learning the language and culture of the people sought out is essential. Christ comes for all as one of us, one of them especially. 
nativity sets with Chinese, African, or Mexican holy families do not offend God any more than Italian Bambinos, English Marys, or American Josephs. We more than tolerate differences. We embrace them. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy are maintained when we go to the world. The Catholicity of the Church is a largeness, but not vagueness. The Vincentian canon goes with this ideal that we represent that held always everywhere and by all. And finally, apostolic. The Church is apostolic in a continual retention of its original mission from God, who sent them out the meaning of apostle to be sent out. As Christ himself was sent from God to earth, he sent out his apostles. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem that which were them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, Galatians 4. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. We've said it before, Matthew 28. Christ gave a mission to his apostles. Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, receive you the Holy Ghost. An apostolic church <clears throat> speaks of perpetuating itself. A succession without break, informal succession that has a history. By Episcopal hands, a trustworthy church is continued. Any defects in technical succession are eventually and spiritually cured by the faith of the people and intention of the church to supply. And by an overlap when several bishops consecrate at once, needing only one valid to affect and perfect the ordering. The Donatist's complaint could only have an uncertain validity for one generation among those who had recanted and only if their contrition were not genuine. But then the purpose of the church and the overlapping of many hands would necessarily erase any defect, real or alleged. We carry a sacred trust and deposit, the dispensation of God's grace, truth, sacramental verities in the Eucharistic community. Truly, we carry out the pattern recorded in Acts 2.42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Surely the apostles' creed are four gospel accounts. The epistles and the apocalypse are apostolic records for us to steer by the apostles' doctrine. For us, new doesn't mean good or improved. Apostolic means antiquity and validity by error, by trial, error, counsel, action, and tradition. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needed for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Jude chapter, th or Jude, verse 3. All right. That's our presentation. Now, let me ask for uh, discussion. I'll shoot it out to gallery view. <clears throat> what do you think of these statements? Priests and bishops should lead holy lives. Why do we see such failures in personal holiness if the church is true? They're human beings with failings. Okay. Clearly so. The church is... is not the people is not them per se the church is an independent organism okay thank you deacon anybody else got an answer for our pathetic performance morally <laughs> the question kind of presupposes that uh, deacons and and laity get a pass but uh i i would agree well, with that. I, I don't mean that but I understand, but I would agree. I, I mean, you look at St. Paul, uh, who said that uh, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You can't yeah. do better than St. Paul, you know. 
wife and I were watching season three of The Chosen and looked at each other after one episode and said, imagine that we have a better marriage than St. Peter. And I, and I know that that's, you know, that's a, that's extra biblical, but, but it's certainly not within, without the realm of possibility that St. Peter and his wife had difficulties. Sure. Sure. I mean, if the major two commandments are to love and to love and Christ gave strong commandments to forgive he's assuming there's problems he's assuming that human problems are going to create tension and troubles and, and knock people around and he's saying love and work from that motive of love and then immediately forgive uh, find a way to, to get forgiveness to be in action so yeah um the church is more of a hospital than an army at least sometimes mm. have you not found so um certainly a, a hospital for repentant sinners and people who are trying to do it right but don't always get it right now when in a church priests or bishops particularly and deacons and laity but uh stronger requirements for the higher offices uh when somebody is in is in error or trouble or sin, we don't just wink at that. I'm not. I am talking about that, but we we have a way to get restoration, and that's what the church is for to get us restored to God, so that we don't live in that fear and that shame and that. Well, I would say also that Satan works harder on bishops and priests because their fall would be greater and have a bigger effect on the church which he's a, he's an economist he, he works with leverage yeah sure he comes after you this is the truth good money thank you okay second question peter thought up the replacement apostle before pentecost how could he be led by the holy spirit if the spirit was not yet on earth is that the a true question the holy spirit has always been the holy spirit has always been been where people feel the holy spirit was involved in the creation good genesis chapter 1 verse 2 right good and uh the holy spirit when Jesus introduced the idea of his coming, the comforter, he said, uh, he has been with you and now is going to be in you. So there's going to be a change of relationship, but he's not saying he's been absent. Well, I've heard this, this uh, opinion reflected by non-Catholics that, uh, that Peter was shooting his mouth off and, and ended up uh, picking the wrong guy because it was supposed to be Paul or some, something like that. Hmm. Uh, you got to have 12 and, and it's, it's got to be somebody that God picks up and Pentecost hadn't happened. So they didn't have the Holy spirit. That's really cartoon simplistic. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think that's, that's fair to say that. And, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Jesus breathe and give them the Holy ghost yeah. basically meaning the 12 yes. rather than at Pentecost where the Holy ghost descended on the whole congregation. Yeah, you know, the Holy Spirit can be given to you in a number of forms. There's a baptismal form where he comes to indwell us and, and wash us and make us new and alive. There's a form of empowering that happens at confirmation. There's another form at each level of holy uh, ministry. Uh, we lay hands on not to give suddenly the Holy Spirit that's been missing all this time, but to unlock the certain powers or ministries or... or uh, positions that are to come so right the holy spirit wasn't absent in fact in a, and another qu quick note is if you look, study that acts chapter one passage where peter had encouraged the election of matthias not a word of that comes back and says but he was in error you know not one word in scripture says he was he was trying to work too far ahead of the game doesn't say that anywhere but in those 10 days, he did that to, to quickly fill that. He felt inspired. He saw those Psalms that said, you got to replace this guy. There was a uh, 
there was a, a principle that would work and this this happened in the places where christianity took over from pagans where a pagan temple or ashram or something was sitting in a city and it was the main part of their their spiritual lives and when christians took over the city well or when people all converted to the to the faith they tore down the shrine of the goddess or the god or the idol or whatever but then they built the church right on top of that foundation they would bring it up and make a church there now some people have complained about that and said well you see they're just they're just falling in line with syncretism or or um uh, paganism no that's not it at all it's saying if you come to find out about god you're going to come and find about the real god this is where it really is so um what is swept away has to be replaced by something better and judas was swept away he he uh he was judged and judged himself and went with his bowels gushing out of, of all things and so he's gone so you got to fill that see it's a it's an appointment that christ has set up and so he did uh it makes sense so and there was not one complaint in all of scripture to say matthias was the wrong choice or uh peter was wrong so i don't think you you dare go and add that caveat that the holy spirit was not guiding it okay the church is not one so how are we supposed to know which church to follow or to believe in these are all in quotes, by the way. I'm not proposing to be so sure. How are you arguing with this person? So much dis disunity. There's 50 different Baptist sects and 40 different Anglican bodies in the country. And uh, you're all disunified. So how am I supposed to know which to follow? And I don't want to believe in any of them. I, I might suggest that the church with a capital C is one. The churches with little c's are not. Mm -hmm. Very good. You want to develop that any further, Charlie? I do, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Jesus's church, God's church, is one, but we have uh, broken it. As I as I mentioned in my letter to you the other day, I, I mean we have we have sadly broken the body of Christ uh, into innumerable pieces. Um, some are better than others, and some are more comely parts than others. Uh, but uh, uh, I mean, the sadness is that we're not going to be able to get together, as you pointed out in this lecture and in last week's uh, anytime soon. But uh, the church with a capital C is one church. Mm -hmm. There certainly isn't going to be a Baptist heaven and an evangelical heaven and a charismatic heaven and an Anglican heaven and a Catholic heaven. No. No, it's one heaven and one church in there. The ultimate end is all the faithful come together. So that's what God looks down and sees. He sees his people and he sees who are his. I think that's fair to say. Any other comments? I think we've got to run this one. When you talk about the, the church, I think as I read Hall that he makes a distinction between churches which have some connection with the uh, uh, Pentecost and all that, and churches which are uh, schismatic in the sense that they've been started by individuals. You know, think of some famous uh, church guy with a, a giant mega congregation, TV shows, and stuff like that. And there might be some question. Yes, he, he loves God and lo believes the Bible and all that. But is his church really a true church or something created by a man, perhaps, to glorify himself? Fair enough. Fair enough. I, uh, I'm thinking but then the, the other thing. question to follow yeah. that would be, yes, his church was created to glorify him. But within that church, you know, he does, he may preach the Bible and there may be somebody saved out of all that money grubbing. Sure. I had this very conversation last week with a buddy of mine who grew up a Methodist preacher's kid. And he was, he was asking me, how can you, 
how can you hang your head on a religious organization that was founded in the sinfulness of King Henry VIII? And I said, you know, the, the grace of God works through everybody, even him, even uh, even uh, Mary the first. That is always a good problem to try to solve when you're talking to people. Let, let's hear, well, wh how did you refer, how, what did you tell him? That's what I said. I said the grace of God works through sinful people. Okay. And uh, God's God's will is going to get done regardless of how sinful I may be or Henry may have been or Henry, Mary the first may have been. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Right. Charlie's answer is good, but there's just one one little silly historical aside. Um, Henry the Eighth burned a lot more people than Bloody Mary ever did. <laughs> Most of his wives, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the uh but then our church wasn't founded on henry the eighth it's founded on christ that's it's right a little earlier a that's whole right. earlier. Yeah. we are a continuation from the time of the apostles whose uh successors led out in missionary effort and came to the english isles and formed uh the church here but it's all one continuum the church of england and the Anglican Church did not start in the 16th century. Hello, uh, it gave it became independent of Rome because of a political severing by Henry VIII, and because of his own motives, which we don't embrace. But that's fine. He's he's uh, he's done for, as far as we're, we're concerned. But then the Church found itself separate from Rome and was able to make those changes that they felt necessary. And and it was. If you look at the history of the development of the Book of Common Prayer, more than half, a lot more than half of it, is based on the Latin Rite in England before the Reformation. Sure, right. it's all serum. The serum missile, sure. Quite so. Quite so. All right, gentlemen and lady, thank you very much. Um, Samuel, will you bless us all and, and, and come out? Oh, you can't speak? All right. All right. Uh, well, Father Paul, perhaps you'll offer a prayer to finish us. Are you there? Yeah. For our Holy Father, may the Lord have mercy upon us and keep us safe. For he is good and he loves mankind. Amen. 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 God bless you all. We'll see you next week for Class 24. Thank you. Thank you.